Okay, welcome back. Um, so I think we'll do uh, several things today. First, I would like to give a brief review of the previous contents. And we have talked, we talked about the, the computation graph uh, and use computation graph representation uh, for logistic regression. And then we come up with the uh, the forward flow and backward flow for uh, a simple logistic regression model. And we say that this kind of a model is the so-called uh, neuron or the so-called neuron unit is simply a computation graph that accomplish, accomplishes the, um, the function for logistic regression. Okay, so uh, we have introduced a bunch of uh, mathematical uh, expressions for the forward pass and backward pass. And uh, for particularly the forward pass is uh, straightforward to understand. Like it's a dot product between the parameters and the input data plus some bias terms. And the activation functions, say a sigmoid function is a element wise operation on the, uh, on the output from the linear computation. So if we combine the linear parts and the activation part, we put it into a circle, we put it into a, a single unit, then we have constructed a neuron, okay? So the neuron does two things. First, a linear combination, and then a nonlinear uh, activation function. And then we use the output from the nonlinear uh, activation as the, um, to compute the loss for a single example, okay? So there are also a bunch of terms that we uh, have newly introduced, which will be further uh, used in the next uh, couple of slides or in the next couple of lectures when we talk about uh, deep neural networks and convolutional neural networks we will use the same uh, terms to describe the parameters in a neural network model okay so a neural network is essentially um, a collection of uh, neurons, okay? But we organize those neurons into layers. And we stack those layers uh, vertically in each layer. We stack those uh, neurons in each layer vertically. And in each layer, we have a uh, super superscript number to indicate number of layers, right? So in this case, we use the integer number one in the superscripts within a uh, box within the square brackets to indicate this is the current layer one, okay? And for layer two, we just uh, increase that layer number, okay? And um, one layer actually, um, so before we introduce layers, we have neurons, right? So in a neuron, we have W and B as its parameters, okay? But since within the layer, we have multiple neurons and we need to stack those Ws and those Bs into uh, <clears throat> a unit, into a matrix of larger size. So basically we will have the capital W for, to indicate all the parameters, to indicate the parameters for all the neurons in one layer. So in this plot here, the capitalized capital W indicates uh, all the lower, all the lowercase w's, okay. We have a w for 
this first neuron for A1, for computing A1, and we have W for A2 and W for A3, W A4, A4. If we put all these Ws into the capitalized W, then we have a matrix, okay? And we also can put all the B bias terms for each neuron into a larger, into a longer vector, which we call the B superscript one. Okay. And <clears throat> next we can use uh, this matrix um, notation to carry out um, forward pass um, so we can um, conduct the matrix multiplication uh, instead of the dot products. So previously, if it's just a one neuron, then it's the dot product between a vector, uh, which in between a parameter vector and the data vector. And now our parameter becomes a matrix. So it's a basically a matrix multiplication that we need to conduct for, for, for each layer, okay? All right, and the Computation for straight for the for the forward pass. I think it's um, uh, it's it's easier to understand because it's a matrix multiplication, and the implementation in Python or in Numpy it's it's just the the call of uh, dot products, okay, and the trickier parts is the backward step, okay? So here, I think in the last uh, lecture, we didn't uh, mention how to compute the backward step, right? We just uh, ended with the forward pass. Uh, but the backward uh, step for a neural network actually relies on the uh, way that we already uh, the relies on the method for uh, the single neurons backward step. So let's first review briefly about uh, about the backward step for a new for a logistic regression model. Okay. Um, right here. Share my screen again. Okay. So for computing a logistic regression, we need to uh, define the loss for a single uh, for a single data example, data points, right? So the loss is like. Um, the y times logarithm of the activation and the y minus one times logarithm of one minus activation. So uh, these are the just the formulas for the computing the loss. And what we really need are the gradients to tune the parameters. Um, so if we use this, uh, the the step-by-step step step backward style of computing the gradients for each uh, node in the computation graph, right? It's uh, uh, easy to, to uh, device, to, to uh, derive the uh, derivatives of the loss with respect to each variable, okay? So the activation, A is an intermediate variable. When we do the, uh, when we want to compute the logarithm, uh, the, the derivative with respect to this, we just take the formula of the, <clears throat> the loss and uh, treat A as the uh, unknown variable, which will give us this form. And this uh, derivative, which we will store, use a, use a uh, short name, which we call DA, okay? And this DA will be passed backward to the previous to the previous node, which is Z. The computation of Z 
uh, because the computation of A relies that of Z, so we can use the gradients of A to compute the gradients of, of Z, okay? According to the chain rules, the gradients for Z is the gradients for A times the, um, the derivative of the function that connects Z and A, okay? So these derivative of the function that connects A and Z is really that determines how the gradients of Z will be computed, right? And if this activation function is a uh, sigmoid function, right? If it's in this form, then we know that's the uh, derivative. We know that uh, it's derivative of sigmoid function is that certain form. So we can take that form to compute the gradients for Z, okay? And the DZ is something that will be further passed backward to the parameters, Ws and Bs, okay? And the Ws, uh, the, the Z is a linear combination of W. So it's quite easy to um, come up with the coefficients associated with W, which is X1, right? So the, the, the gradients for W1 and W2 are also pretty easy to compute in this case. And the, so we, we stop here in the example, right? Because we, there's no need to go further back. There's no way back. We stopped here because we reached the input layer, we reached the input for X from X1, X2. X1, X2, these are data and they don't need to be uh, tuned by the model. They are not part of the model, okay? So <clears throat> that's just a, a one a neural and you can think of it at, as a, a one layer, okay? So the input layer is, we, we refer to the, actually the, the input layer refers to the, the data, but the, 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 the only layer we have that we have here in this case is a neural, is a single neural, okay? So the backward step will not go to the data, okay? But you can imagine if we connect more than one layer, if we have two layers, then from the perspective of the second layer, okay? Then when the DZ uh, goes backward, it should not only go to Ws and Bs, but also should go to the activations from the previous layer, right? So because to the second layer, the input is not data, but the output from the previous layer. So the gradients of DZ should pass back to the activations. And these activations will play similar role as the activation here, right? The activation will also generate its own uh, gradients, which will be passed further along, okay? So we that's what we will primarily focus on in the lecture today. We will start talking about uh, the back propagation algorithms, okay? So that's so much for the uh, reveal. I will uh, close this um, slide and let me share another slide. There's a question a little bit confused. Wouldn't DZ be passed to the previous hidden uh, layer first? Yes, DZ will be passed to the previous hidden layer, but it will also be used to compute the gradients for the current layer, which is the Ws and Bs, okay? When it's passed to the previous layer, after it's passed to the previous layer, then it will be, uh, then the gradients will be compute, will, will be used to compute the, the, the gradients for the previous layer, okay? So I think it's, a. Uh, uh, not that clear to explain in plain language. So I will uh, open the slides for the lecture today. And hopefully with the help of some visualization, the backward uh, steps will be uh, <clears throat> easier to, to, uh, to capture, to, to, to understand. Yeah, I understand that with language without 
plotting all these layers out. It could be hard at the beginning. So let me share this screen. All right. Okay. Let me open up the chat. All right. So we will like officially talk about how the back propagation is uh, where we'll do the uh, computation for all the gradients for all the layers in the neural network. Okay. So this is, a, uh, is I would say a very smart uh, algorithm and it's, uh, it takes some time to, to, to understand and to have all the um, little small piece of jigsaw puzzles to, to connect each other. But uh, I hope the visualization in the slide will help you to digest uh, the, the, the algorithm, okay? So I, we will start with some preparations uh, like the activation functions and the, how the derivatives are computed for the activations. And then we'll uh, talk about uh, backprop. Okay, so actually there are uh, multiple types of different uh, kinds of activation functions. We have experience with sigmoid function, okay? So in this two layer neural network, we have the hidden layer that have four neurons and the output layer that has only one layer, uh, that, that only, only, have, only has one uh, neuron, okay? So when we compute the outputs from a data, we will need to first compute uh, the Z for the, the Z1 for the first layer and the activation A1 for the first layer, which is the hidden layer. And the A1 will be the outputs, will be the inputs for computing Z2 and A2 is computed upon uh, Z2. So now in these two layers, we both use sigmoid function as the activation function, okay? And the sigmoid function has the property that the output ranges from zero and one and then it's a S shape, okay? So um, this function is particularly useful when we do, when we want the output to be um, between zero and one. So that is useful when we do the logistic regression, okay? But uh, we can replace this uh, activation function with a more general uh, form, like we call an activation as G, okay? So we can um, uh, use G1 to indicate the the layer, the activation function for the first layer and actually uh, G2 for the second layer. So the typo needs to be fixed. It's actually G2 for the uh, second layer. So the different layers can have different uh, activation uh, functions. And because sigmoid has its own limits, uh, sometimes we can use other types of um, activation like the 10H here. So the 10H function is called hyperbolic tangents and it um, experiences tells us that it almost works better for hidden layer than sigmoid function. And mainly because the output has a basically a broader range. So the output could be a negative value and a positive value between negative one and uh, uh, positive one, okay? That's a commonly used uh, hidden uh, activation function. But we have downsides for both activation functions. When the Z values, when the Zs, when the inputs are close to zero, then the gradient is also very small, okay? The, the gradient diminishes very quickly near the point zero. So we can uh, use a third type of activation function called ReLU, uh, rectified linear unit, which is basically um, kind of a linear function. So when the input is below zero, the activation remains all zero, okay? So there's no basically no output when the input is below zero. But when the input is bigger than zero, then the activation function becomes a linear function. 
So we combine two lines together in this graph, okay? So the gradients for this activation function is actually um, um, a discrete set. So when the input is uh, negative, the, the gradients of the, this activation function remains zero, but for the input is positive number, then the, the gradients is a, a positive one. Okay, so um, the ReLU has its uh, advantage over sigmoid and 10H. Basically, um, from its um, um, faster training speed. Okay, because the uh, gradients for ReLU function is uh, larger than the gradients from um, sigmoid or 10H. So, so in practice we'd often use ReLU as kind of the default choice for hidden layers because it uh, learns uh, faster than 10H or sigmoid. But the, the sigmoid is uh, still output, uh, is still uh, useful because when we want the output to be between zero and one, uh, that is basically uh, our only choice, okay? In a binary classification. Uh, problem. Okay, so uh, let's talk about about bit about why we need activation functions. Okay, so we know that a neuron has two parts: the competition for Z and active and the competition for A. So why not so we just lean, use linear activations? Note the difference here. We let a1 to be directly Z1 and A2 directly to be Z2. There's no nonlinear activation functions. So it just becomes a bunch of linear combinations. And actually we will find that if we only, if we use these linear combinations or linear activations, we'll be in trouble because for example, the A2 will be, um, W2 times A1, right? And we know that A1 is also uh, a linear function. So by substituting A1 into the form of A2, we will have this uh, longer function, longer uh, expression, but this seemingly more complex expression is no different than a linear, uh, uh, a linear function itself, okay? So if we combine W1, W2, we have some new um, matrices here, right? Which we call W prime and then some new uh, bias terms here, which we call B prime, okay? So this seemingly more complex expression for A2 is no different than a simple linear uh, uh, combination, okay? So that means if we don't use nonlinear activation, then it is no, the, the resulting expression for the intermediate output for the activations, it is no, um, it, it is not more uh, expressive or not more uh, complex than a standard logistic regression, right? Because we just are feeding a bunch of linear activations and, to the output, okay? There's no difference if we, no matter how many neurons we set in a hidden layer. So the activation, nonlinear activation functions is actually uh, the part that uh, does the magic trick, okay? So without these nonlinear activations, we are not doing uh, anything more uh, uh, sophisticated, okay? Uh, but, that said, the linear activation, it, it could be useful in some cases, like if you wanna do a regression model, right? When you want, when you want the output to span across a, a longer range, okay, uh, linearly. So uh, that is a pretty uh, flexible choice, but uh, within, for the other hidden layers, if you want to build some neurons that really pick up uh, patterns, then uh, a nonlinear activation is a must choice. Okay, 
So let's uh, <clears throat> consider the derivatives of the activation functions. We have uh, uh, one slide uh, in a previous lecture as a practice for computing the derivatives with uh, the derivatives of sigmoid and uh, tanh functions, right? So for sigmoid, uh, it looks like this. So when we take a derivative of the function with respect to uh, z, we can find that the derivatives is actually uh, can be computed by the outputs, right? The output a, which is a times one minus a. Okay, that is a very useful formula. And for 10h, the derivative of the function is also computed by the output, which is one minus the output square, right? And for ReLU, it's a kind of more special, it's a discrete, uh, uh, discrete choices between zero and one, okay? So we keep just keeping this in mind. And later when we, when, when we do the backprop, we will just use these uh, values to, to plug in into our uh, formula. Okay, so now let's talk about the gradient descents for neural networks. We have uh, that many in this particular two layer neural network, we have these parameters to tune. We need to find the W, uh, tune W1, W2, B1 and B2 so that the resulting model fit the data very well, right? So we will first look at uh, the input dimensions, okay? Which defines the shape of the parameter W and B, okay? So we have the input dimension, the input data is N0, okay? And the number of units in the first layer is N1, okay? And then the number of units in layer two is N2. So we will know that the first set of parameter W1, the first weight matrix, um, it has N1 rows and N0 columns. It is N1 by N0 matrix. And B1 has uh, N1, uh, elements in it. It also has n1 rows, but it has one column. Okay, and for b2, similarly, we have the size of it is n2 by n1, and for b2, it's n2 by one. Okay, so that's the general principle of the set out of the uh, of the setup of the parameters. Okay, and uh, we'll consider the case of a binary classification. So our cost function can be right at this form. The cost function is the summation of the loss with respect to each single training example, the loss of each uh, data points, we sum up that loss and then averaged by the total number of uh, training examples. Okay, so that is how we uh, um, define the uh, the cost function, okay? So I think more precisely speaking here, it shouldn't be a uh, minus, but should be a comma because we are not actually subtracting the, uh, the prediction from the actual label, right? We are using the second, uh, the activation from the second layer and we want to measure the difference the difference between the activation and the actual label as kind of a loss function. But the form of the loss uh, is something that we define for the logistic regression, okay? So we need to use this uh, cost function to compute the derivatives with respect to all the parameters, like what we usually, like what we previously did for, uh, whatever model we, we, we learned right? for a linear regression model, for logistic regression models, we just use the same thoughts. We need to know the derivatives of all the parameters, right? Uh, the derivatives of, of the cost function with respect to all the parameters, okay? Maybe the only difference is that now the parameter is a matrix. It makes things a bit more complex because the parameter is no longer a single number. 
it is even no longer a vector, but it is a matrix. So that's something we will need to figure out uh, in this case, okay? Okay, so the next step is to find a way to compute the gradients for all the Ws and Bs, okay? We'll take the uh, uh, strategy that we use in the um, competition graph example for logistic regression. We will start from um, uh, a backward style, but we start from the output layer. So here's the review that we have done uh, previously. So I'm gonna go through this real quick. That's for a, a single layer neuron, how we compute the DAs and DZs. Okay. okay, so maybe one notation that we may uh, simplify is this one, right? We previously, we know that, that we, we write the DW1 and the DW2 separately. We say that DW1 is A minus uh, Y times X1 and the A minus Y times X2. And if we write the DW and DW2 into a vector, Okay, so this DW vector in bold, it's a vect vector that has the same shape as your uh, vector W, okay? Then we can represent it as a result of a dot product, okay? We can first lay out the, the, the gradients vector DZ, right? And then we also times it with the a uh, vector x1, x2 transposed, which is a row vector now, okay? So which we've got a, um, um, a vector for, a, a row vector for the dw, okay? Right, and the dz here is a single number because we, um, it's, a, it's a single neuron here. So this uh, expression here is, uh, something uh, that we will find with a similar pattern in the next slide, okay? But the, the idea of transpose, transposing uh, X into a row vector is kind of uh, the, 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 the trigger or the trick that we need to have in our mind, right? Uh, because in our convention, all the data are laid out into vectors, into load or column vectors. Say the first data is like X1, X2, right? We lay out all the vectors into columns. So if we transpose a vector, a column vector into a row vector, then we have a horizontal flat um, vector, okay, which is the same shape as the parameters because we know that we have set up the parameters as a row vector, okay. Uh, anyway, let's uh, go to the next uh, slide that will uh, analyze how we uh, conduct uh, the back propagation in the, using a two layer neural network, okay. So we will basically uh, having two parts stacked with each other, okay? So if we look at the right half, it's a kind of a similar to a neuron model that we shown in the previous one. And this is the one that uh, connects to the uh, right, uh, the right parts. So some gradients will be uh, backward, flow backward, okay? So we will, uh, start from this right part first, okay? And because we are using a binary case, a binary uh, classification case, so here the DA of the activation at layer two, note that we have the little two in the superscript indicates this is the second layer. The, so, but it's the same, still the same uh, formula, right? When we compute the gradients of DA, it should be, uh, such a form, that's what we know, right? And using DA, we can compute uh, the DZ, which is also the same form as A minus Y, but the difference is that we have a little superscript two here, okay? That's all we know. And for W and B here, it's a bit different because um, 
um, W is a large matrix now, but the, the, the gradients for DB is still the same, okay? Because Z is a something plus B and the Z is the same dimension uh, as B, okay? So DB is simply the gradients copied, uh, co the gradients of Z copied to DB, okay? So how about W? So when we compute the, uh, <clears throat> the gradients for a matrix, we need to uh, carefully investigate, uh, carefully examine the shape of the, uh, of the matrix, okay? So here we will look at the, this, the, the, the shape of W2. So it's a bit special because the output layer only have, uh, output layer only has one neuron, okay? So that means the W2 associated with that neuron is a one by four um, matrix. It has one row and four columns, right? So when we do uh, the computation of Z2 in the forward pass, we will put the row that, that capital W2, which is actually just one row, right? Which we write in the lowercase to indicate that this is actually a row vector, okay? So the W2 in, in this uh, capitalized W is just the first row, right? And then we will lay out the activations from the previous layer, from layer one as a column vector. That's how we do the forward pass, right? That's how we co compute the Z2. Okay, so now we need to know the gradients of W, right? We, so we need to know the derivatives of the Z with respect to W. That's what we need to know, right? All we need to know is this, is the gradients of the derivative of Z2 with respect to W2, which is, which equals the gradients of Z2 with respect to lowercase w, because now we only have one row, okay? And we will show that it's just A1 transposed, the gradients, okay? Because uh, we will have more detailed explanations next, because the DW needs to be the same dimension as W2. Okay, so if we transpose the A1 from a column vector to a row vector, it will be the same dimension as the W2 uh, matrix vector here, okay? So we have DWs, the uh, DW2 computed. It is how we compute it is by taking DZ2 and times it with the A1 transpose. And A1 is the uh, input from the previous layer, is the input from the, is the activation from the layer one, okay? So yeah, that's how we compute DW2 and the DB. And then we are basically done with the output layer, right? Because the output layer only uh, have, is associated with W2 and B2, okay? And then because there is a connection from here, from the first layer to the second layer, we need to pass the gradients back to the first layer, okay? And because the computation of DZ, the computation of Z relies on the activation A1, okay? So the gradients of DZ2 will be passed to, uh, will be passed to A. So we can compute for A1. So we will compute the gradients for A1 using the gradients of uh, Z2, which is DZ2. So using the chain rules, we can compute the gradients for A1 by times the 
multiply the dz2 with the gradient with the respect uh, the derivative of uh, uh, z2 with respect to a1. Okay, so the this gradients the derivative of uh, z2 with respect to a1 is determined by the parameter w2, right? So the shape of it is w2 transposed because we want the uh, gradients of a1 to be the same dimension as, to be the same shape of a1, okay? And uh, because we know that the a1 is a column vector, but in this case, the w2 is a row vector, right? Is a lowercase w2. So in order to make the gradients of the a1 same uh, shape as the activation a1, we need to um, make it a column vector, right? By transpose it, okay? So I will write this down here. This is also a uh, pretty, well, pretty critical formula. We need to use the transpose of W2 to uh, and times it with the DZ2 to in order to compute the gradients for the A1, okay? So now we are reaching the, we are in the first layer, right? So remember in the second layer, we start from uh, DA2 here, right? And now we have reached the DA1. So everything will be basically repeated, okay? After DA1 is computed, we need to compute uh, DZ1, right? And DZ1 will lead us to the DW1 and the DB1, okay? So maybe the only uh, difference is that the shape of W1 and B1 is different, okay? But, uh, um, okay, so, uh, there's uh, uh, one more thing we need to mention, which is uh, probably different here, is that the connection between Z1 and A1, there's still an activation function, okay? So uh, why there's such a difference is that we, uh, just by default, we think that the activation from Z2 to A2 is a sigmoid function. Right, we, we believe this is sigmoid because it's a binary classification. So that's why we have, we have this one to uh, DA2 to DZ1 very quickly because that's uh, we already, something we already computed. But for uh, the step from DA1 to DZ1, we need to uh, be more careful because we need to consider the activation functions that determines the derivative of A1 with respect to Z1, okay? It is not necessarily sigmoid function. It could be 10H, it could be ReLU, okay? So we should be more careful here. So we will use the uh, gradients of the activation function as a more general answer, right? We don't know what the uh, activation function G is between the, uh, between Z1 and A1. So we'll use the general term G and we use this prime to indicate that we are computing the derivative with respect to Z. Okay, so this depending, this really depends on what activation we choose to use for the first layer. Okay, so we have DZ1 computed. And after DZ1 is computed, right? Um, and one more notation, one more note is that this uh, star here is a element-wise uh, uh, multiplication. Okay, it is um, because the activation is an uh, the activation function is an element-wise operation applied to z1 to compute a1. So the derivatives also need to be applied uh, multiplied to DA1 as a element-wise uh, multiplication, okay? All right, after DZ1 have computed, we'll write it as this form because we simply uh, copied the form of DA1 
to here, right? That's the form, complete form for computing DZ1. And the next steps, DB1 and the DW1 will be similar to the computation of the DW2 and DB2 here, okay? So the only difference is that W1 is, uh, in this case, it has more rows, okay? It has four rows instead of, just, instead of just one row. But the relationship when we uh, compute the, the transpose operation that we need to use are basically the same as the way we compute the DW2. And uh, for uh, DB2, it's the, for DB1, it's the same as uh, DB2, okay? So the, I put the computation uh, and then its explanations into different uh, colors. So after the uh, lecture, if you, I would recommend you to read, to go through these uh, slides more for several times so that you know why the computation of DW2 uh, is such a form, why we need to transpose A1 and uh, why we need to transpose W2 here. The reasons are explained in the uh, text of the same color, okay? So we have one more slide here explaining, uh, yeah, one more step explaining why, how we compute uh, DW1, okay? As I said, it's a bit similar to the way we compute um, DW2, okay? DW2 is the DZ2 times A1 transpose, and A1 is the activation from the previous layer. So for DW1, it's the same thing we want to use, same principle, but here we use X transpose because X is the previous input, right? Because X is the input layer. And for DZ1, DB1, it doesn't change, okay? And we are done here because we don't need to uh, compute the uh, gradients for the data. We don't need to do the further back propagation. After the DW1 and DB1 are computed, we are done with a complete uh, back propagation uh, process, okay? So I put those um, highlighted dashed color, like dashed red color boxes because they are uh, an uh, uh, analogy to each other. The two layers, we have similar forms for the DWs and we have similar forms for the uh, DBs, okay? So um, we are, uh, we have already spent some time on explaining why we need to transpose uh, the matrix W2, why we need to use uh, DZ2 times A1 transpose, and why we need to uh, transpose W2 when we compute the, the DA1 from DZ2. So that's a special example because the output layer only has um, one unit. So it, it would, uh, uh, I think it would take a, a bit longer to uh, have the connections if the W is a, um, how to say, a multiple, it has multiple roles, okay? So in the next slides, we will gonna go deeper into the W1 because W1 is more general. It has more multiple uh, roles, okay? So um, let's think about the idea of computing DW1. So DW1 is what we call the gradients of W1, but W1 is a matrix, okay? So the, the, uh, the statements of gradients of a matrix itself is a, not a straightforward, uh, it's non-trivial uh, statement because we know the gradients of a variable. We know the gradients of a vector, but the gradients of a matrix is something that we need to carefully think about. 
right? So using the formula here, that's the forward pass from input to the hidden layer. That's how we compute Z1 from the X, <clears throat> okay? So in order to compute the gradients of DW1, right? We need to know the derivatives of Z1 with respect to W1, okay? But how do we do that when W is a capitalized symbol that represents a matrix, okay? So <clears throat> remember when we compute the gradients with respect to a vector, what we, are, what we do is actually compute the derivative with respect to each component of the vector, right? But for the um, derivatives with respect to a W, to a matrix W, we actually need to do the same thing. We need to take the partial derivative of each component of Z with respect to each element of W1, okay? So it's a more complex situation here because the Z here is also a vector and the variable W here is a matrix. So we basically need to take each component in Z and take the derivative of Z with respect to uh, each element of W1, okay? So if we take that uh, expression of Z1 out to zoom in a bit for analysis, then, uh, and we ignore B1 here because we are not computing DBs here. So the form of Z1 is like this. So Z1, we have a uh, subscript. Wait, let me see here. The subscript here is the first component of Z1, okay? So how we compute Z1 is to take the first row of the W1 and uh, conduct a dot product with the data X, right? So uh, that's how Z1 is uh, computed. So if we want to take the derivative with respect to W11, right? We just need to take first Z1 out, take the partial derivative of it with respect to W11, as shown in the red box, okay? And this red box needs to use the results of the dot product between the first row in W and the X and takes the derivative with respect to W11. And for the second component, we should take the derivative of Z2, which is the dot product between the second row with respect to uh, W11 and respectively for Z3 and Z4, right? It's just taking the corresponding row in W and take the derivative with respect to W11. But we notice that there's only first row that contains W11, okay? Because the green and the yellow and the blue rows, they don't contain W11. So only the first row contains W11. So the result will be just one number, which is X1, okay? And we just extend this to other components. When we compute, the derivative with respect to one, two, it's also only X2 left. If we, the, the derivative with respect to W13 is only X3 left, right? So we're done with the first row of the X of the W matrix. And if we take the derivative uh, with respect to uh, the derivative of Z2, with respect to all Ws, there's only one, two, three, X, uh, X1, X2, X3 left, similarly. And for Z3, it's also the same. For Z4, it's also the same, okay? So altogether, if we take the derivatives, if we take the deriv partial derivatives and then lay them out 
in the matrix style, it'll be like this. The partial, the derivative of Z1 with respect to W1 is also a matrix, okay? It's the same shape as W1, but the values in it are the data, okay? The values in it are, are, are the data. So coming back to the uh, gradients, if we want to compute the gradients of DW1, we need to take the gradients of DZ1 and times it with the derivatives of Z1 with respect to W1, okay? We need to take DZ1, DZ1 itself is a vector and we need to time it with a the matrix of bunch of x1, x2, and x3 in multiple rows. So all these expression can be written by a short form of dz1 times x transpose, okay? Because it's the results of uh, having dz1 as a column vector on the left and x transpose layout as a row vector. If we times a column vector with a row vector, that's how we get a matrix like this. It's, it's, it's more like, a, it's, it's, a, it's like the outer product in linear algebra, okay? So if we take the uh, column vector and uh, a row vector and we compute each possible combinations of product between the, all the components of these two vectors, then we are computing the outer vector. So the DW1 is basically the outer vector between these two vectors, okay? That's how we compute the DW1. Okay. And uh, I think I'm gonna stop here uh, because the rest of the slides will be based on the analysis that we have done on this slide. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, the most critical parts in understanding back propagation because the derivatives of the DZ with respect to the matrix W is the most, uh, um, uh, I would say the most difficult part to understand. Uh, but if you uh, lay out the forward pass formula and uh, derive backwards, uh, as shown here, it will be uh, quite easy to find why we need to transpose the input vector and uh, use the outer product between the, uh, the DZ with the input vector, which gives us the, uh, uh, the matrix here, okay? So um, I think we can, uh, and the lecture today here. And uh, some of you have asked questions about previous uh, uh, solutions to the previous assignments. I think I can make a few media, uh, videos out of it. And uh, so that you can go through the solutions uh, with, with particularly with some uh, tasks that you are confused with. Uh, so, I will make that video about uh, linear regression and the logistic regression models uh, solutions and I'll post it later uh, to YouTube and to Canvas. Um, yes, uh, let me stop the record here.